Matthew chapter 10, and we'll be looking at verses 5 through 15 this morning. <clears throat> I wonder if the church really understands the urgency of getting the gospel out today. There is so much going around today. Uh, blessings and, and interesting situations. As you know, a seed has been freed from his imprisonment along with uh, several other Americans and and Marines, I believe, and they're on a plane now flying over here from Iran. <clears throat> it was a part of a deal with Obama as he was giving them $150 billion. That's a lot of money. Someone calculated that out. If, if he were to give us, the United States, $150 billion, it would mean that every man and woman in the United States would have a million dollars. That's how much money it is. Think of that. But it was a part of that deal. But don't be deceived. Um, he, he, at the last minute, put that in there. It, it kind of makes him look good. Hey, I want those guys freed. You know, and you're still getting your money. You're still getting all the other perks that are going along there. Back to the UN and embargoes lifted and, and so forth. So we're living in an interesting world. But do Christians really understand the urgency <clears throat> of getting the gospel message out? You understand your surroundings and the people around you and how much they need to hear that gospel message. Do you understand what awaits a non-believer? Someone asked me after the first service, is Hades a holding place or is it hell itself? Do we understand all of those questions? Do we know what the implications are if we don't know Jesus Christ and where we'll go? Uh, Jesus is encouraging his 12 disciples here to go out. In fact, he's commanding them to go out. Let's go ahead and read the text and then we'll, we'll get into it a little bit more in detail. It says in verse 5 of chapter 10, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leopard, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff. For a worker is worthy of his food. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and there stay till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Now surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. We will observe Christ commanding his disciples to go out to Israel and preach the gospel message to them that the kingdom of God is at hand. Good preaching will always include the kingdom of God is at hand. We notice that ministry here will be by faith. They will need to trust in God for all of their provisions, including their words and including their meals. And it seems like Matthew here is more concerned for the disciples and how the disciples responded than any other situation. He doesn't give us all the details as to who was healed, uh, who was resurrected, and, and what all those particulars are. He's more looking at the disciples and how they're obedient to the commandment of God and how they are to go out and trust in God, which I find interesting because there's a principle there for us. God is more interested in how we respond to him than, than the things going on around us. Sometimes we focus on the things going on around us more than how our heart is responding to them. Does that make sense? You know, when we're in a situation and we get angry 
and we're saying I'm justified because of them. When in reality, God is saying, why are you angry? Why aren't you trusting in me? Where is your faith? I thought you believed in me. And we're like, oh, it's not about them. It's not about what is going on around you. Even with the $150 billion, well, we could do here at the church if every one of you had a million dollars. Imagine that. But it's not about that. It's about what we're doing with what we have now. Are we being faithful with what we have now? Are we being good stewards? Are we representing Jesus Christ? And so Matthew seems to be looking at the disciples' response. We should look at ourselves first, always. <clears throat> Whenever I give biblical guidance, one of the first things I hear from people is, but you don't know what's going on, or you don't know how they treat me. You know, I, I understand that, and, and those things are definitely real in our lives, and, and we have to deal with those things. Um, we have to look at what others are doing and correct them if they're believers and give them good biblical principles and tools to use instead of getting angry, instead of lashing out, and instead of, you know, saying things that they shouldn't say. I, I totally get that, but we have to look at ourselves first. We have to confront our own self. Why am I... Why am I so upset? Why can't I have words of grace? Why can't I have words of grace? You know what grace is when, when you understand why someone is hurting you and you forgive them anyway. That's what grace is. It's having favor <clears throat> on someone. And so God is more concerned about you and how you respond to your surroundings there are a lot of people that are struggling out there and struggles will come and go but how we respond is important so god watches how we respond especially in the urgency of the gospel how do we respond with that the disciples are commanded to go and we'll see that in a minute are we going is that command true for us today I believe it is true for us today. We're to go out and make disciples of men. We need to look for those opportunities. So I have uh, given the theme compelled to go. And not in the sense that, that Jesus is forcing you to go, but in the sense that, that you see the urgency and you, you're just compelled to go out of compassion and love. Because we see the compassion of Jesus Christ for Israel, the Jews. And we see the love of the disciples for the Jews also as they go out. And share the kingdom of God, which is at hand. And we need compassion. We need love. We need to see people through the eyes of Jesus. Somebody loved you enough to share with you the gospel message. They cared about you enough to say, you need Jesus. You need eternal life. And they shared with you and you accepted that message. We should care for others also. We should see that without Christ, they're perishing. They really have no hope. They're, they're kind of like that mouse on that little treadmill. They're just running the race. And nowhere are they going. Just running around in circles. And they fall off once in a while and get back on the treadmill there. No, we have purpose. And that purpose is in the kingdom of God. So let's look at this in more detail in a couple of points that I want to make. Three, <clears throat> verse five. These 12, Jesus sent out these apostles and he commands them to go out. And so it's not a suggestion. It's not an encouragement. You know, could you guys, you know, really pray about going out? No, it was, you are going out. I command you to go out. And this word is a military word and it is authoritative. And so when Jesus commands, we should listen. It would be good for us to understand and practice the things that Christ commands us. Christ does not command us because he's some sort of dictatorship, that he has something to prove. He commands us because he loves us or he loves those that he's sending us to. That's why he commands us. And it's also a reflection of our love for him. Do you want to know how you love God? And you know that you love God? You ever ask yourself, do I really love God? I know I do sometimes. And I find that when I'm sinning and not doing what I'm supposed to be doing is when I ask that question. Because the reality is, 
is that Jesus told John to write down, if you love me, you keep my commandments in first John. And so the evidence that you love God is that you keep his commandments because you know, his commandments are going to be beneficial to you and to your family. It keeps you safe. We have rules and laws in this land and these rules and laws are there because they keep us safe. Now, some are dumb. I, I get that, you know, and they're ridiculous and they're for other reasons, but those that protect us, you know, the a sign and says, warning, electrical hazard, do not climb this fence. We go, ooh, let's climb the fence. No, we say, ooh, don't climb that fence. At least I grab onto something and uh, there I am getting shocked. No, Jesus commands the what's, the how's, the where's to preach. And we should hear. He says, first of all, do not go to the way of the Gentiles. Now, <clears throat> when you read this, you can't just read this. You have to read the whole Bible and understand that he's not saying, look, I don't care about the Gentiles. He's not saying that. I don't care about the Samaritans. I only care about the Jews. He's not saying that. What he's saying is to the 12, first we start with our house. We share the gospel with them first. And then I have another plan. And that plan will include the whole world. A Gentile was a non-Jewish descendant. Uh, a more broadly uh, term would be someone that's not under the covenant community of God's people. They were considered pagans in the Old Testament, uh, non-Jewish. We would be Gentiles unless you are, you are Jews. It would be later on that Jesus would include the Gentiles there in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, when he tells his disciples that all authority has been given unto them on heaven and on earth, and they should go forth and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things. And that's what we do today. That's what I'm doing right now is teaching you to observe what's in the Bible to all nations. Paul and Barnabas takes this and realizes that the Jews rejected the gospel message there in Acts chapter 13, 46. And so they go to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are included, but at this time, not along with the Samaritans, neither enter the city of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were basically half Jewish and probably half who knows what, maybe Assyrians and so forth, other, other parts of nations that the Assyrians had captured and they brought them into there in Jerusalem and they began to cohabitate and they created what we call the Samaritans. They're not included in this either. You can find more on them in 2 Kings chapter 17. We do know though that later on, Jesus in John chapter four literally goes to a Samaritan woman and you see the compassion and the love that he has for this woman, the grace even knowing that, that she had many husbands and yet he still offers grace, the amazing grace of God. And then he talks about the, the good Samaritan, that parable. And so the Samaritans will be included also, but this command is for the nation of Israel. First to them, Christ came first to his chosen people. And so he says, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, go rather to is in the Greek, keep going to. And so that was their mission, uh, to keep preaching the gospel message wherever they went. Matthew 15, 24 says, but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So we hear that phrase, lost sheep. What is he talking about? Jeremiah says, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. Chapter 50, verse six. Israel is lost. They are lost sheep without a shepherd. Their shepherds have led them astray. The religious system has failed them. And Jesus viewed them in that manner as lost sheep. And the emphasis here is upon the lost in the Greek, the fact that they are wandering. And we saw that a couple of weeks ago, if not last week, Matthew chapter nine, verse 36, where he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary, scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he saw that <clears throat> and he wanted to correct that and give them a shepherd to follow. And that shepherd would be Jesus Christ. That would be the leadership that he sets up in the body of Christ and in the 
churches there. And so the lost sheep of the house of Israel, referring to the whole nation, to all of Jacob's descendants. You know, it starts at home first, doesn't it? And Jesus was smart in doing that. There's a reason for him doing that. But it does start with your surroundings, with your family. When, when I first uh, got saved, the first person I went to was my wife. And I said, you need Jesus Christ in your heart. And she's like, you know, Virginia, <laughs> I've been going to church all these years. And now you're telling me I need Jesus Christ. Well, you've been sitting there every Sunday morning watching football. You know, yeah, <laughs> you do. I remember the day that, that um, a week or so on a Saturday morning, I got up early and I drove from, Ro from Redlands all the way to Roland Heights. And my mom was still asleep in her room. I opened up the door and I woke up, mom, you need Jesus Christ. And she's like, what are you doing here? What do you mean I need you? You need you. I have Jesus Christ. I've been going to church since I was a little. No, you need him in your heart and he needs to be real and you need a personal relationship with him. She's like, okay. I go, well, accept him right now. You need to say this prayer. So repeat it after me. And she did. She did. First, it's important that we reach our household, right? Our, our spouse and our children, all my boys. I made sure, oh boy, did I make sure. I drilled it into them. And whenever they did something that, that wasn't uh, Christ-like, I said, are you sure you're a Christian? Because Christ doesn't do that. Yes, I'm a Christian, Dad. I am. I'll correct that. You know? I drilled it into them. But they know the Lord. And then I would go from there outside and impact my surroundings as the Lord would lead me. You want to impact the world around you first, your family Acts chapter 1-8, they were first to go to where? Jerusalem. So it's in, very important that we impact them first. When we moved into this area, Mariloma, uh, <clears throat> we, were the, we were the first owners of the house that we're in now. <clears throat> and we impacted our block. There were a lot of people in our block that the Lord saved through my wife and I. Um, I would say there's maybe two or three homes that weren't saved, but the rest God just got a hold of and we got them in church and some of them are still serving the Lord. I can remember a young girl, our next door neighbor, they had uh, three children <clears throat> and we would continually invite them to church. Her name was Ruby and she was in her uh, probably 12, 13, right around there. And she came to church and she's just kind of watching everybody. My wife and I were, were sitting back there and the last time that she came to church or the next time, all of a sudden she's watching and she's like, well, they're raising their hands. So all of a sudden she raises her hands and she just starts singing and praising the Lord. And me and Virginia looked at each other and we're like, wow, you know, just goosebumps. And well, this is what it's about. Uh, across the street, we went over there and, and shared the gospel with a whole family, uh, the husband, the wife, and the daughter. Can you imagine telling somebody, just being this bold, say, let's get on our knees and repent and ask Jesus in our hearts. How many of you would do that? I did that. So let's get on our knees. And they said, okay. And they got on their knees. And they asked Jesus into their heart. And as far as I know, they're still serving the Lord. Uh, another uh, a lady and her husband and son we minister to our surroundings. I'd get the boys. I would get the boys and I would tell them, let's just go over to so-and-so's house and let's just help them. You know, it's a new block. Everyone's building things. And so we would grab our wheelbarrows and our shovels and we'd go over and just help. Hey, you need help today? Saturday morning, let, let, we'll help you. Like, yeah, thank you. Wow. And so boys are going, man, your boys are hard workers. Yeah, they better be. Put them to work. See, that gave us an opportunity now where they felt obligated to hear us. And so when we're all done, you know, we had the opportunity to share with them and they had to listen because they felt, well, they helped us all day long, so I got to listen to them. <laughs> See, I look for opportunities like that. See, the, the message is always the same. The technique will change. It, it will change. Jesus was smart. He, he was smart in that he knew 12 Jewish boys preaching to Gentiles just wouldn't work. So let's hit the house of Israel first. Start at home and watch what happens. And so they were to go out, verse 7, and preach, saying... The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message doesn't change. The message is still the same. 
And we are to understand the message, know the message, and preach the message. That's our responsibility. How you preach it, the techniques you use, is up to you and the Holy Spirit. I used to use evangelism explosion. Some of you might know what that was. Usually you come up to someone and say, hey, if you were to die today, and you're standing at the gates, why would Jesus let you in? Whoa. Because I'm a good person? Eh, nope. You're not a good person. Have you ever sinned? Yeah. So why would he let you in? Because uh, I go to church? Eh, no. You know, and so you just keep getting them, and then you have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. <clears throat> or the Romans road, right? Romans, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, you know, and you share the Romans road. And then at the end in John, uh, in Romans 10, what, uh, 20 something, 10, you, you, if you confess the Lord, believe in your heart that you raised from the dead, you'll be saved. Romans road or Ephesians chapter two. Today, uh, many of us use the master's way, right? How many of you have lied? I'm like, yeah, I lied. How many of you have stolen? Yeah, I've stolen. So if, if you go before a judge, are you guilty? Yeah, I'm guilty. So you're guilty before God because you've broken his commandments. And so you need Jesus in your life. The, the methods, you know, always change. Uh, we were at the, the missions conference and one of the missionaries that was speaking said that every time he comes out to this mission conference, he always takes the opportunity to preach the gospel somewhere. <clears throat> this year, he was at Starbucks and he saw a young man sitting there. So he just started talking with him. Just, you know, conversation. Hey, so what are you doing here? You live in the area, blah, blah, blah. And the young man said something. Yeah, I live in the area here, you know. And then he said something about God. And guy goes, oh, you believe in God too? And he saw the opening and he starts sharing about God. And so he took him to Matthew chapter 1. And when he said that, I'm like, how do you preach from Matthew chapter 1? That's the genealogy of Jesus Christ. But then you go, wow, I could see that you could, you know. You want evidence that Jesus is in the line of David? Here it is. Jesus is who he said he was. He is the Messiah. He fulfills all prophecies concerning that. And the guy ends up accepting the Lord right there at Starbucks. You know, methods always change. Here's the thing is that we have to understand the message and then be willing to give out that message because the kingdom of heaven definitely is at hand. And then he says, heal the sick, cleanse the leopards. Raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now, as I said earlier, there's a lack of a Greek article here. And so Matthew is putting the emphasis not on the healing of the sick or the cleansing of the leopard. He's putting the emphasis here on the message. On the message. The message is more important than the healings, than the leopards than the raising of the dead or casting out demons. What he's saying is, is that make sure the message gets heard. You, you go to someone that is sick and you anoint him with oil or you help him and then you send them off. <clears throat> so you heal them. Big deal. They, they go off. They're still going to hell. If you see a leopard and you cleanse him and bring him back into society, big deal. So they got a friends for a while. They die and they go to hell. If you resurrect someone from the dead, big deal because they're going to stand before God and be judged. So make sure that the message is involved. <clears throat> if we give out homeless packs, make sure the message goes along with the homeless pack because, yeah, they'll be warm for the night, but for eternity, they'll be on fire. So we have to make sure that the message is a part of our healing, cleansing, and raising, and casting out, definitely. You probably know the story of Pastor Chuck. <clears throat> when the Lord challenged him to get into the ministry and become a pastor teacher of the church. Uh, apparently Chuck, well, you just listen to him, you know he's brilliant. Just a blessed, anointed man uh, I believe he probably had a photographic memory. Um, I've just, I've seen him at times personally and watching him and he just, just teaching, preaching from memory, you know, and it is amazing. And he wanted to be a brain surgeon like Ben Carson. He wanted to be a brain surgeon and God challenged us. Do you want to heal men temporarily or do you want to heal men eternally? He thought, wow. And he chose eternally. 
we have to get the message there because it is about the message. Um, it's not about you serving here. That's not what's important, though we need you to serve. But it's, is the message getting out? Are you leaving here without hearing the gospel message? As far as we know, we don't even see that they raised anyone from the dead here. Matthew doesn't tell us or the other gospels. Jesus doesn't say. Uh, but apparently they did. We know later on in, in Acts chapter 9, Peter went and turned to Tabitha and she rose from the dead. Uh, you, Tychus, who was sitting in the window listening to Paul, fell asleep and fell out the window and died. You know, probably a couple stories, who knows? Not three feet, but probably a couple stories. He dies, hits his head or something. Paul goes out there, lays on him, and, and he resurrects from the dead. So there's power there, definitely. But the message has to go out. It should be a priority, and we should understand the urgency of that message. And freely you have received, freely you give. Somebody loved you enough to share with you the message. They didn't, they didn't charge you for it. They freely gave it to you, so you should freely give it to others. You should see that it is a privilege to give that message to others. It really is in the urgency of it. Provide, he says, neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belt. They would carry their, their money in their money belts. Kind of like what we have, you know, a girdle. Um, I'm wearing one right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> they would take money and they would put it in the girdle, you know, and hold it there. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't provide for yourself any silver, gold, copper in those money bouts, nor a bag for your journey. Uh, usually the bag would also carry money or their clothing, like a, an extra tunic there or a sandal or sandals or even a, <clears throat> an extra staff for the workers worthy of their hires. Jesus is saying that what you should do is trust in God and that God will provide for you. And that as you're sharing the message, which is important, when people receive that message, they will want to support you. <clears throat> they will want to support you. Once in a while, not often, <clears throat> someone will come up to me, like I said, not often, and say, you know, I was, I'm just really blessed with your ministry. And they'll actually hand me a check, which is so awkward for me. I don't like that. Um, and I'm like, wow, what a blessing that they're giving me, you know, some cash I can go to Starbucks with. <laughs> and then I look at it and it says Calvary Chapel Inland. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's actually for the church. <laughs> and so then I go put it in the box, you know, but once in a while it does happen because they're appreciative, right? of hearing the message, their life has been changed and they see that they're on a right track and they're being blessed. And so they feel, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some, I want to give you something. I've, I've done that myself and I know you have too. So Jesus is saying, I'll provide for you. You don't have to take uh, some extra sandals. Interesting about the sandals, uh, they did wear sandals. And when we think of that time, we think of, you know, laced up sandals and it goes up to the ankle. That's more of a Roman sandal uh, that they would wear jews did not like those and they wouldn't wear those we do know that they had shoes we find that in paintings in some of the sculptures that they had full-blown shoes that they would wear uh, shoes were uh, probably the lowest <coughs> of the clothing they were a sign of humility you would usually have a servant that was the least of all your servants. He would be at the door. He would be the one removing your shoes and washing your feet for you. As he removes the sandals and cleans you as you come into the house. And so the, the Jews looked at the, the sandal as of humility. Um, you remember Jesus went to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said, I am not worthy to even remove the sandals of Jesus. So John was saying, look, that's, that's the place of the lowest of servants. I'm not even that low. I mean, I'm, not, I'm lower than that. I can't even untie the sandals of Jesus Christ. And Jesus wore those sandals because he was uh, the kinsman redeemer that uh, Ruth chapter 4 verse 8 talks about. Our kinsman redeemer, the Old Testament Goel. Uh, that redeemed us because we have been um, stolen, kidnapped by the enemy. And so don't even take an extra pair of shoes. 
Trust in me because a worker is worthy of his salt. God will provide for you as you serve him and as you are faithful to serve him. Chuck Smith said, however, you're not to go in and make yourself a burden or lay yourself upon people. He was big on that. He had another saying, you know, where the Lord guides, <clears throat> he provides, right? <clears throat> there was a track that was discovered <clears throat> in uh, 1873 it's in the library of the monastery of the most holy constantinople <clears throat> it was assi assigned a date of anywhere from 100 to 120 a.d and it was a tract that they believe uh, came from the apostles uh, and the early church gentiles and in this tract it talks about those that were sent out <clears throat> to the mission fields as apostles or um, missionaries in the 11th chapter it reads as follow and every apostle who cometh to you let him be received as the lord but he shall not remain except for one day if however there be need then the next day but if he remains three days he's a false prophet he might be taking advantage of you he might be seizing the opportunity that you're gracious and say, hey, I'm going to stay a week. I'll be here a month, you know. And so there's another motive beyond just going from house to house and sharing the gospel message. It goes on and says, when the apostle departeth, let him take nothing except bread enough till he can lodge again. But he, if he asks for money, he's a false prophet. Again, the motive. So where God guides, he provides. We need to let the Lord lead and guide us. So Jesus says in verse 11, Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire. And it is worthy. And stay there till you go out. So the word worthy is one of value. So there will always be a person who appreciates the message, who values the message. And they will then provide for you. And when you go into a household, definitely greet it, you know, have, have some peace, some grace, a, a gesture of embracing and you maybe even kissing and saluting them for allowing you to come in. And if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. I mean, bless it. Let, let God's grace be there. But if not, but if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. In other words, uh, don't bring peace upon it. Don't pronounce a blessing on it the lord will will be the one to work there in the home and whoever will not receive you verse 14 nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city shake the dust from your feet so if they reject it and more than likely we will get more rejections than exceptions to the gospel message there are always more rejections than exceptions because broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to life that's just life and so be prepared as you share that message that people will normally reject it and so sometimes it takes time to build relationships with people it takes time for them to see that christianity isn't what they've heard. And a lot of times people out there only hear what Christianity is. Or they may see on TV and they get a preacher up there who's talking about money all the time. And, you know, he'll get up there and you want to see my faith? Look at my Rolex. That's how much faith I got. Well, he'll be rolling in it. <clears throat> That's not true Christianity. True Christianity is about humility. And I think you see true Christianity here in this church when you see the servants serving the Lord. And they're, they're serving because they love Jesus. And when Mariana <clears throat> first started serving the Lord years ago, uh, she became one, our administrator. And she does it freely. She doesn't get paid for it. And all these years, she's been faithful to do it. Do you know there have been Christian brothers and sisters who questioned her. Why would you do that for free? 
These are the brothers and sisters that don't understand the grace of God. They don't understand or appreciate what God has done for them. And they are judgmental. And they are the ones that mislead people. She's doing it because she loves Jesus. That's why she does it. And, and we have a church filled with people who just love Jesus and do it. Guys who come 5.30 in the morning, 6 o'clock, setting up so that you can get here and be comfortable. That's why they do it, because they love you. There's a lot that goes into preparing this place that's done by, by love. No other reason. You know, they don't come Friday, Pastor, give me my check. <laughs> They know their rewards in heaven and many who cook and prepare for free at times. So it's done freely because they have a heart to give. If people aren't willing to receive that, <clears throat> Jesus says, just shake off the dust from your feet. Give them unto Satan. First Corinthians chapter five, read it. Give them over to Satan. Let him take care of them. To the Jew, <clears throat> getting dust on your feet, especially if you're traveling in Gentile territory and then coming back into uh, Israel, you're like, oh, we don't want no Gentile dust on our feet. Let's shake it off. <laughs> so Jesus was being pretty harsh here. You know, have nothing to do with them. Shake that dust off. Interesting term. We get the term biting the dust, right? You know that that means, right? Biting the dust. You get hurt in sports. Oh, he bit the dust, you know. Or they bit the dust because they suffered defeat. And boy, will they suffer defeat because they rejected the gospel message. And Jesus says, Surely I say to you in verse 15, it will be more tolerable. It will be better off. More grace would be given to the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? God rained judgment upon them. Nuclear holocaust. Boom. And it'll be more tolerant for them in the day of judgment than for those cities that reject the disciples' gospel message. The word more there suggests that there are degrees of punishment. So, I don't know if that's good or not. I mean, you're still eternally damned in hell, but I guess a little less fire is better than a lot more fire. I don't know. Or, or maybe the company that you're, you're with, uh, either way, you don't want to go there. But apparently Sodom will have a little more grace than, than these cities uh, will have. And God is talking about the day of judgment here when we will stand before God. Believers will stand before Jesus at the Bema seat of Christ, and we will be rewarded for what we do here on earth. Yes. So what you do here on earth, God will reward you <laughs> in heaven. So if you're serving the Lord, then God will reward you as you get to heaven. If you're not serving the Lord, then God will reward you for what you're doing here on earth. So you may stand before him, and as you're standing before him, and, and, and he says, okay, Let's see, what have you done? And you go up there and you go, nothing. <laughs> and he says, okay, well, I'll reward you. Go over there and stand with the thief on the cross that made it into paradise because he didn't do anything either. But others will come and we will bring everything that we have to him and he will reward us for those things. That's why it's so important that we understand the truth of that. You do get paid. You might not get paid here to be an administrator, to set up and things, but you are getting paid in heaven. And God will reward you in heaven and what you do on this earth. So the more you do, the more you'll receive. And it's the attitude of how you do it again. Matthew is talking about how they responded and their attitude. So get busy so you have more rewards. Someone asked a question earlier after the service. They talked about Matthew chapter 19, and it talks about the 12 disciples being judges over Israel along with the Lord. And so I didn't know the answer at that moment. So I, I looked up some things and apparently the word judge is not necessarily talking about judging them, but ruling them. So it's a more of a ruling position. So one of the rewards in heaven is that you will be a ruler over certain cities. So some of you might be ruling Mariloma <laughs> or Riverside or California. 
Isn't that awesome? Well, I don't know how to rule. You will then. <laughs> you will then. So what you do here is very important. But there's another judgment seat. And that is a great white throne judgment that we find in Revelation chapter 20. If you want to turn there, please turn there. And that's the final judgment when God will give an account of all of humanity. They will all stand before him. Every one of us will stand before God. We will see him at the Bema seat. They will see him at the great white throne judgment face to face. <clears throat> this final judgment we see in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. John says, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. Speaking of God or Jesus who sat on it because Jesus will be the judge from whose face the earth and the heavens fled. So those who rejected the gospel and they fled from the presence of the Lord, they will be standing there seeing his face. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, great, standing before God and a book or books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. God writes everything down. Everything that you do, he's keeping track of it. It's got a page and it's got your name on it. And one to five million, he's writing everything down. Oh, they just did this today. Oh, they were in church today. Oh, they were serving today. Oh, they weren't serving today. Or they did this. Or they had an opportunity to share. There was an open door, but they didn't share. Or they did share. And they were faithful to share. He writes it all down. In the world, he's writing everything down. Look at them. They're out partying on Friday night, sitting in a bar, drinking a margarita. You know, uh, They're with their friends, cussing and swearing and telling bad jokes, you know, boom. He's writing everything down so you have no excuse when you stand before him. Now, those are all supposition. Uh, I, you won't find that in the scripture, but I'm giving you an idea of what possibly could be there. He opens up these books and he's, they're written in them. And it says in verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one according to his works then death and hades were cast into the lake of fire that's eternal damnation it is a lake of fire jesus says where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched gehenna gehenna is a little valley on the eastern side of old jerusalem today and it was the waste area. They would throw everything, all their trash, garbage, dead animals, sometimes bodies down in there. And it was a perpetual fire. It was always on fire. And so when Jesus said Gehenna, they pointed to that valley as it was burning. And Jesus said, where the fires never quench, it never goes out. Where their teeth are grinding because they're in torment and pain and suffering. It's what John says here is what he saw. And this is the second death that he sees. So the first death is our death here on earth. Then we go to heaven and we stand before Jesus Christ. If you're a non-believer and then he sentenced you to the second death for eternity, not a good place guys. And then he says, if anyone is not found in the book of life, cast him into the lake of fire. <clears throat> death and Hades were cast into that lake of fire. That is the second death. It's not a place you want to go. So the message hasn't changed. If you are going there, then the message is this. You don't have to go there. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Follow his commandments and he will put you on a path of blessings. Give your life to him and he will give you eternal life because you put your faith and trust in the work of his son, Jesus Christ. Let me give you just a couple of of points of application here. Use what God has given you to share the message with those around you. Take that opportunity. Listen and hear. Study the Bible. Get some tracks. We have tracks here. We've written personal tracks here for ourselves. They're available to you. Uh, I don't have one with me. Take them. They're blue for English. 
green for Spanish, no particular reason, just came out that way. Um, use them. There's other tracks that are out there. Understand them, memorize them, and take the opportunity to share with those around you because we don't want them to experience Hades. We want their names in the book of life. When Jesus opens it up, we want to see their name there so that he'll say, welcome into heaven. Why should I let you into heaven? Because I put my faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ alone. I don't deserve it. I've never earned it. But his death on the cross, his blood that was shed, was more than enough to allow me to come in. Welcome in, because you understand that. Secondly, make sure your name is in the book of life. If it's not in the book of life, then remedy that today. Come up afterwards, speak with Fausto or Pat, and make sure your name is in the book of life. Surrender your life to him, because not just confessing him, but now giving him your life. Surrender it and begin to work on yourself. Allow God to work in you to remove whatever sins in your life, because he doesn't want that sin in your life, because the sin is hindering you from his blessings. You have to take that step forward.